sound we hear right here is Jake's tail thumping against the side of his kennel here. Oh, he wants out, don't you, Jake? We're going to get you out grouse hunting in just a minute. As promised, back in October, we are on our midwinter, mid-December grouse hunt with Tom Prodzik, wildlife biologist from up here in the Gladwin area, and Tom Opry. Tom, sure. our first hunt together on Michigan Outdoors. That's right, as a matter of fact. And we are going to spend about two and a half hours in the woods, in the snow, in the cold, in the ice, and see if we can't get some ruffed grouse, show you what they look like after all. We just got woodcock before, Tom. Right. Chances yep. look good? I'll tell you what, we'll talk about that in yeah. just a moment. You stay tuned. We're going to go grouse hunting and see if we can't get some rough grouse because it's Thursday night, time for Michigan Outdoors. From the rugged shore and woodlands of the north, it's history. Well, why don't we uh, let them out? Get on okay. with the hunt here. We have Sam wearing the, wearing the black. Wearing the black trunks and in the white trunks. In the white trunks, we have Jake. Okay, Jake is what, 11 years old? Jake's 11 and a half. He's an old timer. I like to think how many grouse have been shot over that dog, but uh, he's a little gimpy and he moves a little slow, but uh, uh -huh. uh, he still <laughs> finds plenty of birds. Okay, we're getting the collar on there, and you have your electronic collar. Well, Tom. Well, you both have electronic collars. Oh, both of the electronic yeah. beepers. Okay, well, we'll hear those in the woods. A number of people have asked me, who have bird dogs that tend to range wide, how these things work. And of course the explanation is that they, there's an irregular beeping to the collar while the dog is moving. Right. When it stops, the beeping. Pa right. The beeping pauses for about 15, 18 seconds, then it starts beeping at a slower pace. Okay, and then we go find the beeping. Right. Which that, so that's kind of prolongs the excitement of the hunt. It sure does. Oh, okay, right in here. Sam's pointing right to the face of the stump there. Sam is in close here? Yeah, right behind the stump. He's pointing right close. Okay, hold still. You can see him from this side. See the dog. If you cut over more towards the fresh. Yeah, you want to come over here to the dog. The dog's right in here. Right at the base of the stump. Wait, wait. Uh, no bird there. No bird? Yeah. Well. Sam just felt sorry, huh? Huh? Yeah, I saw quite, I saw some oh, back in right here. Too. Look at him in here. Yeah, yeah right down here. here. Look at him in there. No, look at him in there. Oh, I see. So it wasn't. No, he's picking up scent. Yeah, okay, so we had a fresh grouse. Oh, what, yeah, right. What, what happened when there's, right in here. when there's snow? See, the, when there's snow, scent isn't strong. The dogs have a tendency to get too close to the birds, and when bird numbers are low, boy, if you get a dog within 30, 40 yards, mm -hmm. that grouse is flying. And by the time you pick the scent up, the birds might have flown. Mm -hmm. But they've got to be here somewhere. Again. What is this ice going to do to us in the woods, for the dogs or the birds? Well, it might make you fall on your tuckus once in a while <laughs> if you're not careful. Uh, that's... Well, I, outside of, uh, as I mentioned earlier, outside of perhaps cutting the forelegs of the dogs a little bit, if you get a crust and uh, every so often cutting the pads, you get mm -hmm. ice balls up in between their toes. and. Makes them uncomfortable. They lay down once in a while biting at them, and every so often you've got to go down and take some heat from your fingers and get those little ice balls out of the toes so they can keep running. Uh, other than that, it shouldn't cause that much of a problem. What more could you ask from a dog? This never even produced any. You don't see any stem anywhere. Here, come here with the camera. Tom, over here. This is the ideal type of stand of dogwood that we're looking for and the grouse normally feed in here on the berries. But where are the berries? Come on over here. See, the berries are gone. You don't even see the stems where the fruit, you know, should have been. And on top of that, these stems, you know, these dense stems provide protection for the grouse, mm -hmm. too. But so it's an ideal situation. Do they spend any time in this stuff at all now that the berries are gone? Oh, yeah. We've seen tracks back there in this stuff. Mm -hmm. Except the big difference, you see one bird here and one bird there. And when you got, you know, good fruit crop, they tend to concentrate a little more and spend more time in it. Now, it's just a matter of walking, cover ground, and open the... Are, are, are the berries all gone? Pretty much. 
I mean, is this well, a... Well, in this area, there is mm -hmm. pretty much. Other parts of the state, they had a much much better crop. But for us, we'd have to dig out a picture and look at them and see what they In this country, like. right. We don't seem to have a preponderance of hunters out here we've seen. December grouse well, season. <laughs> so, some are smart and some are not. Fred, what can you say? <laughs> well, this is, how does this December grouse hunting stack up, Tom? Well, under ideal conditions, if you had temperatures around 40 and the bare ground, you can have some of the finest hunting of the entire season. But once you get more than a couple inches of snow on the ground, then the dogs aren't helping that much, and you can go from one extreme to the other, just from one day to the next. So I got him. You want to bring from being there? Oh, you just moved. Oh, you just moved. Funny. Funny. Oh, is that funny? Yeah. <laughs> Missed the rabbit. Now, why did he point the rabbit? He's just getting a little tired of no grouse. If I know, if I know we were serious about shooting rabbits after the dog had pointed him, he'd have been a dead one. Seven yards in front of the dogs. Where was it? Here. On the ground? Yeah, it was on the ground back here. I didn't see it come up. Tom heard it, but I saw it come across these trees and turn and go straight out that way. Big, a big mature bird, way out of range. Well, that's it. That's our grouse hunt, 1983. Not, not, yeah. not yet. We got to have, we got to have a prediction. A prediction for 1984, and we ought to come out the same days. What do you say? Okay, but, uh, you know, uh, pick a day when there's no snow on the ground. <laughs> okay. It's much easier. Although we did uh, pick a couple days or a day earlier and then we didn't do too many. You game for 1984, Tom? Sure. Let's do, only, let's do it. Uh, you know what we ought to do next year? We ought to take them out in the opener. The 15th of September? Yeah. You kidding? Have you ever known me to kid? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you see, Mr. Project and I have been opening the grass season together for about how many years, Tom? Too many. Anyway, 14, 15, yeah, we usually do real well on opening day. Now this year it's been downhill slide since there, okay, but uh, well, well, opening day is liable to be dynamite. You never know. Three months late. That's all. <laughs> yes. The best part about it is when the grouse are young and dumb. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we'll go after them then. All right. Well, I guess that's about all we can do. Well, here it is, a roughed grouse, drumming roughed grouse. It was our Artist of the Year Best of Show print by Rob Gwynn, and that's as close as we can come to, to bringing you a grouse this fall on Michigan Outdoors. And Tom Obrey wrote his column last Sunday in the sports section of the Free Press about our hunt. Very nice article. I really appreciate that, telling about the show. I don't know, Bob, if I would call that hunt a failure. Oh, that, that, that hunt was really fun. You know, we just don't. In December, we just don't think that much about grouse hunting, and it was great. You know, the only thing that worries me is that Tom has gone 18 years of grouse hunting, <laughs> never been skunked. With Tom Prodzik. With Tom Prodzik and with his dogs, until now. Do you think we jinxed him? There's no way, no, no way. chance of that happening with those two guys and those two dogs. Well, good. Well, we'll go out and make good next September 15th, but I think talking about trophies and, and game and, and things, we better change the subject to fish for sure because there have been some trophy fish caught in November, December, and those are coming up right now in our Michigan Outdoors Trophy Report. Our first December 1983 Master Angler entry was caught on December 1st, and it's a steelhead trout taken from a popular northern Michigan steelhead stream, the Pear Marquette. It was close to 17 pounds, caught on spawn at 4.45 in the afternoon. John Johnson from Muskegon is the happy angler. You can tell by the color of this fish that it's a big male rainbow, a trophy for sure. 
In November, just before deer season, you'll remember that the weather was mild, well, fishing was good. And here's a lake trout that proves it. A 17 and a half pounder caught of all places at the mouth of the Boardman River in Grand Traverse Bay. Andrew Fitzgerald from Interlochen must know his fishing, because he knew the big ones come in at dark. He was fishing at 10 p.m. when this one hit his spawn. Another November prize, although not as large compared to the others, is this Menominee whitefish. It beats the master angler minimum by a few ounces, going just over a pound, caught on a single salmon egg at 3.30 in the afternoon by Keith Lutz of Saginaw. Again, it's not large, but it is good eating. And a surprisingly popular fish in the spring and fall among northern Michigan pier and shore fishermen. Hey, look at the size of this one. You can tell by the spots and the shape that it's a Great Lakes brown trout, a huge one at that, 23 and a half pounds. This was caught from shore in Lake Charlevoix by Don Perro from Petoskey. He was casting a shore fisherman's favorite, Cleo. Now the fish is only 32 inches long. It's even shorter than the 17 pound steelhead you just saw, but it weighs over six pounds more. That's why Pete Rubianis refers to these as football browns. And finally, here's a fish that we hope isn't a historic fish from its home lake. You recognize it as the largest member of the perch family. It's a walleye. At eight pounds, four ounces, it just makes master angler minimum. And it was caught on a jig and minnow by Harry Ramsey from Bay City. Now, I said this hopefully isn't a historic fish. See where it was caught? Holloway Reservoir in Genesee County. Now, rumors have been spreading that fish like this might be a rarity in Holloway, at least for a while. We'll make Harry Ramsey our Master Angler of the Week for catching this trophy. Harry's a winner for sure, and we hope other Holloway anglers will be winners like this too. So with fingers crossed, I'll let Bob explain this situation in our outdoor headlines. And something from our, well, little uh, area of uh, did you know here at Michigan Outdoors, that one time in Michigan, we did have reindeer, and those were transplanted to just north of Newberry in about 1922. There were 60 reindeer transplanted, and to anyone's knowledge, the last one died in captivity in 1927. Yeah, well, we might clarify, Bob, these were not transplanted from someplace else in Michigan or from Iowa. From Norway. From Norway. Norway. They, they're, they're animals of the tundra. They're not like elk, moose, or the white-tailed deer that we have. Well, also, Fred, there are plenty of the flying variety left, so That's the right. cri kids at Christmas should not worry. Yeah, they're going to be uh, overhead in just a couple evenings. Well, Ed, uh, another brother of the brush joining <laughs> us here. Well, it's beginning to be winter, Fred. And I... Santa Claus, reindeer, two Santa Clauses here. Well, go ahead. Let's answer some questions here from our mailbag. Okay. From our viewers. Here's one from Fenton. I am a den leader for eight Cub Scouts and would like to arrange a field trip for them to watch the taping session of Michigan Outdoors. Please send me any information I might need. Well, we've already sent you that information. We have the phone number right here in our Club Digest. But any of you who want to bring a group or just come and watch Michigan Outdoors being put together, it's taped just a few hours before it hits the air here at uh, Channel 23 in East Lansing, Michigan State University. Call ahead, though. 355-2300. Make sure that we're on schedule that morning and when we're going to do it, make a reservation and you're welcome to come down mm -hmm. and see how we put this together. Mm -hmm. From Ypsilanti, I watch your show weekly and especially enjoy the hunting parts of the program. I would like to see some rabbit hunting stories since the rabbit is the number one game animal in Michigan. I would also volunteer myself and my four beagles to help. Well, we went rabbit hunting the other day. That's going to be on January 12th, 12th is it, I mm -hmm. think, for the second week in January, the second Thursday. But you called up Danny Rutherford. Oh, I called up Danny, and uh, I'll tell you what, we need to go out with Danny because <laughs> <laughs> he's now got five beagles, by the way. He's added one more beagle. His brother's got four or five beagles. And last Saturday, his brother was out on state land with five guys, and they killed 23 cottontails. Mm. I wonder mm. if we will jinx them. No, I no, mean, with the cameras. Well, we're going to go give that a try anyway, and if we do well, well, we'll bring it to you folks. Right now, I want to go to something. You may have seen the Ducks Unlimited okay, magazine a few mm -hmm. months ago, or the Michigan DNR magazine a year or so ago. An article in here about a taxidermist who is really the best in the world. He has had articles in the DNR magazine. He's had articles in Ducks Unlimited. American Hunter, Waterfowlers World, and Ward Foundation are now doing uh, articles on him. He's written for a leading taxidermy magazine. In fact, he's a contributing editor. It's called Breakthrough. It goes to 20,000 taxidermists around the country. Uh, the Southeastern Wildlife Exposition will feature his work in South Carolina in February. This man has won more blue ribbons and more best of show for his taxidermy than anybody in the world. Now, who is he? 
Frank Newmeyer is the man. Hi, Frank. Frank, How I've known you? your dad before I knew you. He's a taxidermist in, That's true. in the Union Lake area where you're from. Mm -hmm. And you turned out to be the world's best. How about that? To everybody's amazement, I wonder. Yeah. Or not. You have quite a determination when it comes to taxidermy. You bet. Why? I sure do. Well, you... it's a big, strong part in my life. You know, it's, um, it's not everything, but it's a very important part mm -hmm. of my life. And it's, it's not only my livelihood, it's, uh, it's a number of things to me. Well, looking at this, for example, drumming ruffed grouse, uh, I mean, this is an incredible amount. How you get the feathers up and the cheeks puffed out. Taxi of the skin, yeah. It's basically taxi of the skin. How to taxi the skin in a proper place takes the repetition of doing it time and time and time until you get something to where you like it. And the only way you're going to know how you like it is to go back to the real bird and study the real bird and imitate what the real bird mm -hmm. is showing you. And that's, I think, probably the one of the keys to your success, besides the determination and the skill, is your study. Oh, for sure. In the woods, photography and seeing action. You've seen drumming ruffed grouse and really observed what they do. You said something here, taxi of the skin. Right. Obviously, tax. what does that mean? Placement of skin. Is that what taxidermy means? Well, in the Greek, it means place, movement, movement of skin. Mm -hmm. uh, dermis is skin, taxi is placement, movement, shifting here or there. Oh, okay. I see. The biggest thing a lot of people don't realize, I think, in taxidermy, in short, is that the medium basically is just the skin in taxidermy. Mm -hmm. And what has to take place here is the skin has to come off the real body. And oh, once yeah, that yeah. comes off, you're separating the tissue from the epidermis. I've done taxidermy. Okay. And, and it's, you, you have just like a, a, wet, a washcloth in your hand. Right. And, and amazingly, my work comes out looking like that. Like a washcloth. Like a washcloth <laughs> hanging on. Well. I, taxi, I taxi washcloth is what I do. Okay. Here is a woodcock. And obviously, this must be a courtship posture. Yes. Yeah. That's one thing about your work, Frank. Everything that I see teaches you something about the animal, its behavior. Our sharp-tailed grouse here. A Michigan grouse? Right. Yep, and that's in the scenic area, it's up up where they dance on their dancing grounds, Correct. and that's what that's doing. And that must take a horrendous amount of time. But here is what you're, I suppose, most known for. Your upland uh, birds are great, but the waterfowl. Look right here. If we can see right on the back of this hen wood duck, right over here, we can see. Uh, get a close up there. These are like droplets of water on there. That's incredible. The details that you put on. He's right there's a drop and a few there in a natural setting. You mm -hmm. must spend a lot of time just constructing the habitat. Maybe even more so than the birds at some times. In some compositions that I do, there's actually more time in the environment than mm -hmm. there is in the bird. They go hand in hand. One complements the other. Now here's a bird that... Uh, it's not done yet. It's not done yet, but right. you brought this to show. It's a, in the swimming posture. Correct. Relaxed and attitude. And that will Humped be... Put, up head. But look at the face on this, the cheeks. Your birds have personality, and that's Thank mainly, you. you do just totally birds now, upland yeah, and yeah, just on waterfowl. Yeah. What would it cost? Just say, by chance, Bob Garner, just, just say Bob happened to get a, a grouse someday. The way I heard, I doubt that. <laughs> <laughs> We're working on okay. it. If he does not brought it to you, what would it cost to have a mount done? You mean in a case like this, similar sure. to this? About around 750 Okay. Wow. Well, that's, it's high-priced work, but you know, it can bring enjoyment. That's the thing about yeah. taxidermy. I think taxidermy, not the discount flat art, not the discount sculpture, but this, I think, is the ultimate art form, using the skin of an animal to recreate that animal. That's as close as you can get to the real thing. Well, thank you. Do you, do you feed these things? I mean, no, not too not much. They're not that close to being alive. No, not too much. But I think you'll agree, pretty darn close, as close as you're going to ever see a mounted animal. Frank, I, uh, we, I'm would like to have you down to the boat and fishing show to put up a big display and it isn't fair to put you on the spot right here because you got to maybe work a few things out but if you could come and bring your work we'll set a big display in our special exhibit area and uh so the people in michigan can come and see your work it would really be great okay well, that we'll see that's my little pitch here to frank to see if i can get him down there so you can see all of his his material frank when you give us that announcement if you can make it we're going to put it on our outdoor calendar which is where we're going right now with ed groves since we went grouse hunting a couple weeks ago, Bob, we're supposed to be having a, maybe a grouse pie recipe, but I had some foresight. We already did a grouse recipe earlier, and Kathy Beitler, our secretary and production assistant here at Michigan Outdoors, is dishing out uh, one of my favorite recipes. It's called pheasant pie. It looks good, Fred. Oh, it is good. You have a fork there, Bob? Yep, got a fork. Okay, now you try that, and you might want to let it cool and give us uh, some critical acclaim on this. What we did, and I'll show you how to make a pheasant pie. You could do this with chicken, with grouse, uh, probably most any type of meat that you have, but it's excellent with pheasant. 
take a pot like this and, and uh, well, we'll start off with about a tablespoon of salt you're going to put in there and we're going to put in a half a dozen peppercorns. Now these are just the, before the ground, the peppercorns right there. And we're going to toss in a bay leaf and a stalk of celery. I've cut it up. It kind of gets the flavor out there a little more. And we will fill it with water and cover a pheasant. Simmer it for how long do we simmer it, Kat? Oh, about two and a half, three hours. Okay, you want it so the meat comes right off of the bones, just like this here. How is that, Bob? Mm. It's great. <laughs> it, it's, it's, you know, I've never had it in a pie before, and it's really good stuff. It, what does it taste like? Does it taste like chicken, turkey, chicken, turkey that sort I, of thing? Turkey. Mm -hmm. I, I think like it's anyway. Mm -hmm. But this it tastes amazingly like turkey. Okay, Kathy, after we take it out, pick the meat off the bones, what do you do next? Melt a stick of butter, mm -hmm. a half a cup of flour. And One stick of butter right. and a half a cup of flour, mix it together. And you save two cups of the broth. Okay, and this you strained. Right. Should I pour it right in yep, here? Yeah, go ahead. Two cups of broth. And this is making a, really a white, white sauce. White sauce, right. And a little salt and pepper. Mm -hmm. Sprinkling of pepper, maybe a, how much? Oh, about eight teaspoon, quarter teaspoon. Okay, and then a little tiny bit of salt. Now, while that is being done and the white sauce is being prepared, oops, forgot one thing. No, that's not yet. It comes in later? Right. Okay, some cream. We take the pheasant, and this is this recipe, by the way, in our Club Digest. I will just follow that here. We'll put in one pound jar of these are, these are small boiled onions. Put those in there. And then we will take a can of mushrooms. You could use fresh mushrooms if you wish and arrange those. We take a box of frozen peas, put those in there, put about that many, and a couple pimentos. Pimento really doesn't have flavor, but it adds to the color and it garnishes it very nicely. That's the basic pheasant pie. We'll also take a pastry crust, make up a pastry crust and put on the top just like we have right here. Pop this in the oven at 450 degrees for how long, Kat? 15 minutes is all. Whoops. Can't do it without the white sauce. Right. I forgot. After we get this arranged, you want to pour that in there? Ooh, this could be tense. There we go. Then we put the pastry on top. Oh, look at that. Have a little bit left over there. Right. Excellent, Bob. Great. Just I, it super. Is. Try that recipe. Write to us this next. Next week, we're going to start off with the new Club Digest, but you can write to us here, and we'll have the, the address coming up at the end of the show. But right now, I want to get over here. We have a little bundle of joy for a Christmas gift that I want to talk about. Well, his name's Rusty, Fred, yeah. little beagle. A cutie. He is. Well, Will Schultz, veterinarian here in Okemos, I know, as a matter of fact, that you don't really recommend that everybody go out and try to buy Christmas puppies. Absolutely not. No, I think everybody that wants a puppy first should determine, do they really want a puppy? What kind of puppy do they mm -hmm. want? Are they going to take this puppy hunting, or are they going to keep it as a house dog, or are they going to do both with it? But probably now it's too late. I think the puppies have already been yeah, bought, right. and they're getting ready to put them under the tree. What should somebody right. do, a family do, when confronted with a Christmas puppy? Okay, the puppy, especially when it's cold like it's been the last week, you want to be careful that the puppy's either going to be indoors or outdoors. If he's out, he should be kept very warm. Um, this time of year, we always want to make sure they're always vaccinated, mm -hmm. checked for worms, kept free from worms. And you also want to check on a certain breeds, uh, certain different foods for times. Uh, puppy chow for, you know, until they're grown up is good mm -hmm. for them. Um, you also want to make sure that they're not exposed to too much cold. A lot of people think little dogs this age should be out running rabbits right away, but they got to get a little bit bigger first before you take them out mm -hmm. for a while. Speaking of running rabbits, this is a beagle. It sure is. How old, how old is Rusty? This is a six-week-old beagle that he's just getting ready to start his first vaccinations and get wormed. Huh. Bob, old. Kathy, come on in here. Of course, Bob... Uh, uh, this is his favorite kind of dog. Yeah, what do we have here? Oh, okay. yeah. Now, Fred, this is Look your Bob. Up. Look at Bob with the pheasant oh, pie. How is it, Bob? Oh, no, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's good. Is that your third I'll plate? I'll tell you because you won't hear it. Or you won't be able to taste it. <laughs> You'll be gone. <laughs> yeah. And Fred, now, yeah, this is your good. Christmas present from the Michigan Outdoor staff, but you can't open it until Christmas. I can't oh, open it until Christmas? Yes, everybody. <laughs> I know what it is. It's that ruffed grouse. <laughs> <laughs> that we've been waiting for. You know. Well, yeah. that's great. Well, thank you. Well, it's not a puppy, though. It's not a puppy. Okay. Well, Will, thanks for coming. Well, sure. Course, thanks to Frank yeah. Newmeyer and all the people mm -hmm. in the past year that have helped us out so much in Michigan Outdoors. Kathy, you're going to be doing more with us on the air this coming year. Cooking. Bob will be eating. <laughs> yes, yeah. you bet. Yes, and Ed, His favorite. great job producing you, this past year. Thank you. I hope you all have a safe and merry Christmas. We'll see you next week right here on Michigan Outdoors. Mm -hmm.